So for many years, surgical oncologists have taken samples from cancer patients and preserved them in FFPE, which stands for formalin fixed and paraffin embedded. These FFPE samples are now being used for molecular diagnostic testing, which means that we're looking for biomarkers in them to determine response to targeted therapies. The thing with FFPE samples, though, is that they vary in terms of how much tumor versus healthy tissue is present and how much any one mutation contributes to the tumor. And since therapeutic decisions are based upon these results, any false negatives or positives can be detrimental to the patient. And this is important because assay failures happen a lot more often than we should be comfortable with. A recent proficiency test by the EMQN looking at EGFR genotyping errors found that only 70% of the laboratories passed the proficiency test. That means that when they were, that these labs, when they were trying to do their very best to get the right diagnostic result as in a proficiency test, they still failed 30% of the time. False negatives and positives were the main sources of error, with the genotype that people had the most trouble with being G719S. So my question to you is, what is the impact of assay failure in your laboratory, and how do you monitor for it? Horizon Diagnostics has created genetically defined reference standards that contain precise allelic frequencies. These can be used at different par parts in a pathology workflow in order to identify assay failures and improve your diagnostic testing and eventually cancer patient care. Next, we will have my colleague Hannah Murfitt talk about validation in terms of regulatory requirements. Hi there, I'm Hannah Murfitt and I'm Product Quality Manager at Horizon Discovery. I have a background in medical biochemistry and medical device quality assurance and today I'm going to be discussing clinical validation with particular focus on the changes to the regulatory framework of laboratory developed tests in the United States. So I found this quote here, validation is always a balance between cost risks and technical possibilities within a Canadian framework document that introduces the requirements of ISO 17025. I believe this provides an excellent framework to discussing the needs for clinical validation and I will touch on the cost, risk and technical possibilities throughout my talk. So here are the definitions from ISO 9000 for verification and validation. Verification is the confirmation by examination and provision of objective evidence that the particular requirements for a specific intended use are fulfilled. Essentially, it is ensuring that requirements and outputs conform to the specifications defined. Validation, in contrast, is confirmation by examination and provision of objective evidence that specific requirements have been fulfilled. In this case, it can be seen to meet the expectations of the customer. For laboratory developed tests and laboratory procedures, this would be the ordering physician or the needs of the patient. Naturally, validation is important across the clinical supply chain. For clinical labs, the purpose of this is to assure a safe and useful service to clinicians and patients. What is important is that validation is not a one-off event. There are new instruments, new operators, and new equipment that ensure that it is necessary to keep continuing to validate and ensure that general monitoring and evaluation continues to occur. So the next slide just covers the general validation requirements, including those for test development, test validation, and platform validation. These are central themes across most of the regulators and include validation of the protocols, the performance parameters, and confidence intervals, including that of software. Most clinical laboratories in the US will be aware of the proposed changes to the oversight of laboratory tests. FDA has long maintained that they do maintain oversight, but have recently started making moves towards enforcing that oversight. And the difference between the US clear regulations and that of the FDA quality system regulations comes down to largely the intent. So the, the difference in the scope, the US clear, clear regulations largely regulate individual laboratories, whereas the current FDA quality system regulations regulate manufacturers. There is a difference in the inspection point with the clear laboratories producing tests 
that are only expected through annual reviews and general assessments, whereas the FDA has a pre-market focus. The FDA focuses on clinical validity, which is the accuracy to which the test identifies, measures, predicts the presence or absence of a clinical condition or predisposition of a patient. This is not within the current CLIO framework and is a key marking difference between the two regulatory oversights. So it can be seen that there's a very different framework, and particularly when it comes down to the framework. So test complexity is used as the means for clear regulation, whereas the FDA quality system requirements will implement a risk-based framework. In many ways, these can overlap. For example, if a clinical laboratory is using proprietary algorithms, these will be both complex as well as in bring new measures for risk management. So in terms of the requirements, they can again be seen to be quite contrasting, but also essentially overlap. Um, so in terms of the US CLIA regulations, they regulate LDTs made and used within a single facility. They focus on accurate, reducible, and reliable tests. The requirements for analytical validation prior to use, and requirements for proficiency testing. The US FDA quality system requirements that have been proposed address clinical validity. They take a risk-based approach to implementation, process validation, design verification and validation, and adverse event reporting, as well as device listing. In contrast, here are the basics of Canadian requirements, which can in many ways be seen as a bit of an overlap between both of the FDA regulators. So this involves the accreditation of medical laboratories in Canada through provincial health authorities. Each of the provincial health authorities have developed their own standards, many of them implementing ISO documents, such as ISO 15189 or ISO 17025. They take a risk-based approach to validation based on the complexity of the test and the level of novelty, so with non-standard methods or ones that have originated from the scientific literature, these can be seen to be offering less risk. They also have requirements for proficiency testing and focus quite heavily on method validation. So to take a look at the potential quality system regulations for verification and validation, Design verification involves validating the design and the standard operating procedures. The design input is required to meet the design output, and it forms part of the design history file. Design validation, in contrast, is validating device through development of production units, confirming that the intended use of the product is a fit for the customer. And again, this is part of the design history file. The focus on the quality system regulations is much more related to design control, which involve design inputs, outputs, verification and validation, and design change. So coming back to my title, cost, risk, and technical possibilities. Cost. Many of the people in the US facing the changes to the regulatory oversight would perceive that cost is one of the most significant changes that will occur. And while that is generally the case, there is still an opportunity for clinical laboratories to work with the FDA and CLIA to develop an appropriate regulatory framework, both for the laboratories and for the patients involved. Risk. Risk features throughout the regulations, both the risk in terms of implementation as well as the risk-based framework to pre-market approval. Most accreditation programs consider this. But it's important to remember that risks are changing. Many LDTs are moving beyond their traditional boundaries of simple tests developed within one laboratory. And technical possibilities. Naturally, with time, there will come new technologies. And only in recent times, it has been seen that genetic testing has its place within the clinical sector. The changes to the standard of care. And there's increasing availability of reference materials, including our HDX reference material. So here are just a few final thoughts. So use of reference materials can assist with validation studies, but there is a clear focus within many of the regulations on the use of patients' 
specimens in spite of increasingly available alternative reference materials, including those from cell line derived as well as synthetic agents. And I think it is necessary for those to be reviewed for their place in the clinical testing pipeline. And where reference materials are mentioned, there is a large focus on cell line DNA over plasmids, in particular with the New York State Department of Health guidelines. The future for the FDA regulations is still being developed, and the impact of this remains up for debate. However, it is important that the FDA public consultation takes full consideration of the opinions of the clinical laboratory to make sure that this is least burdensome, but also relevant to the patient and the future of healthcare. And here are just a few key resources, including a free paper from Nature that covers many of the requirements for next generation sequencing validation. I will now hand you over back to my colleague, Samantha, who will go through a, a study with one of our participating laboratories. OK, so now I would like to introduce some work that was done at a molecular diagnostic lab in Credit Valley Hospital that really looks at the value of including a low positive DNA control in each assay that they run. So for the purposes of this webinar, we will focus on their EGFR mutation status testing. And for this, they use a commercially available kit from Entrogen. This is a real-time PCR platform, so, sorry, assay, so it's run on their real-time light cycler platform. It is an allele discriminating assay, which means it relies on the ability of probes to bind correctly, and then for the real-time PCR platform software to correctly set a crossing point or baseline cutoff value. In order to validate this kit, they used the Horizon Diagnostics DNA reference standards to validate this assay and also to determine the limits of detection for each mutation. So looking at their validation in greater detail, we see their dilutions for EGFR L861Q. We see the real-time data from 20% down to 1% and the crossing point values. But we know that there are certain variants where probe binding is not as efficient and background noise can occur. This is seen most commonly in EGFR T790M and also in G719X, which if you recall from the proficiency testing data we looked at previously is the variant that people have the most trouble with. So if the negative control crossing point value is used in these cases, it can lead to a false positive diagnostic report for the patient. And I guess the way to fix this would be to manually change your baseline each run, but this would really hide quality issues such as this inefficient probinding or background amplification or even PCR contamination in the blank. So back to the validation for these two variants, we see that the last dilution of a 1% mutant allele frequency overlaps with the negative control. If we include another dilution in their validation of 2.5% allele frequency, we see that we actually get good separation from the negative control or background noise. So from this work, they decided to include a 2.5% crossing point value as a cutoff in order in every assay in order to remove the likelihood of any false positives. So if we look again at the results for G719S, when we have included a low positive control, we see that the patient is really overlapping with the negative, and we can safely rule this out as a negative. So the value from including a low positive control allows us to rule out any background amplification and really not report any false positive diagnostic results. And since on the other side of every FFPE sample that's being processed is really a cancer patient awaiting treatment results or a treatment course, and we know that any false positives mean that a tyrosine kinase inhibitor will be given to a patient that really is wild type for EGFR. And this is really detrimental to their care over first-line chemotherapy. So we can clearly see the value added from inclusion of this control, but now I would like to discuss if this should be used as an absolute cutoff value in all cases. When a mutation is in a low percentage of cells in a specimen, the crossing point value will be high and possibly above your 2.5% established cutoff. So how should these be evaluated? 
we have two clinical samples to try and explore this. The first is a 58-year-old female with metastatic lung cancer. She's mutation negative for all variants except perhaps EGFR L858R. If we look here, we see that the L858R crossing point is slightly higher than the 2.5% control. But when we compare this to how the negative control or no template control runs look, qualitative assessment really shows that this is a true positive of about 1 to 2%. The second case we're going to look at is a 58-year-old female with right lung adenocarcinoma, who is also mutation negative for all variants except perhaps the exon 19 deletion. When we look at the crossing point, we do see it's higher than our established 2.5% control, but again, from qualitative assessment of the patient's amplification, this looks like a true positive. So in conclusion, from qualitative assessment, these were ruled as true positive diagnostic results, and the patients are actually receiving anti-EGFR therapy and both report feeling better with less fatigue and are able to work. So in conclusion, crossing point values do not tell the whole story. Um, false negatives can occur if you use this cutoff as an absolute cutoff. And, but if you decide to look at each patient amplification individually, qualitative interpretation makes it very easy to ensure that these are not occurring. And since we know false negatives for any um, patient who actually is harboring an EGFR variant means that they will receive chemotherapy first line, which has been proven to be less effective. So Credit Valley Hospital really includes a low positive control of 2.5% mutant allele frequency in all runs, and this helps them eliminate false positives. The low positive control also acts as a qualitative reference for true amplification so that low positive results can also be reported with confidence. So this really also reduces the risk of false negative reports. And if we remember from the proficiency testing data, false negatives and false positives were the greatest reason for failure. And so we really do need to help eliminate these for better proficiency testing and diagnostic testing for patients. But there is an additional level of analytical utility to this in that it is actually a QC check for each run, and it also provides consistency between different EGFR mutation status testing experiments. And I'd like to look at this in greater detail here, where if we look at the crossing point values for this low positive control at 2.5% across 17 different assays, the confidence interval was actually 95%. So this is really a case study of how one Canadian clinical laboratory used research use only products to help validate their laboratory developed test. They now include this 2.5% mutant allele frequency reference standard in all their EGFR diagnostic tests. What they do is they order individual EGFR basic DNA reference standards from Horizon Diagnostics and then they pool them to a 2.5% mutant allele frequency. They have also included this low positive control for other testing at their laboratory, including BRAF, KRAS, and NRAS. This gives them the confidence that their assays working today provides a qualitative benchmark for true amplification when patients are also low positives or close to those cutoff values. So going back to my initial question at the beginning of the webinar, what is the impact of assay failure in your laboratory and how do you monitor for it? Marcia Spivak at Credit Valley and Trillium Health Partners says the low positive control is critical to our confidence in the lab's diagnostic reporting and analytical results. This is a reference that we used for the PT scheme and that concludes our webinar.